My name is Josh Landay. I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called Gifted Savings. We are making it possible for people to directly gift investment assets to high school students in under-resourced communities. Um, and I'm honored to be here with the whole Tuesday's Children community to talk about the power of storytelling, how to share your journey as a force of change. Thank you to the panel for like setting us up with so many great ideas. You've already mentioned a lot of the things that I'm gonna to touch on in this presentation, but we're gonna build off of each other. And this is gonna be a conversation. Um, so if you have questions throughout, don't hesitate to shout them out. Similarly, similarly on Zoom, if you have questions, if you're able to, shout out, shout out your questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take a moment to say that I really like this picture on this slide because it reminds me that we are all like born with this innate ability to tell stories, right? It's what we do as kids. And then somewhere along the line, many of us get out of practice in telling stories, maybe because of like work stuff or life stuff, or maybe we just feel that we need to be too serious. And so hopefully today, this whole experience of us being together will help us to get back to that like storytelling ability that we have as children. Um, as Catherine mentioned, I feel privileged to have had the chance to work with three different nonprofit organizations that are all using storytelling to expand their impact. First, at an organization called Eye to Eye, now called the Neurodiversity Alliance. Um, and in that organization, I helped to build a story sharing platform that brought college students and high school students who had journeys of growing up with dyslexia, and ADHD and dyscalculia and dysgraphia to share their stories with other kids and parents and educators across the country. The ND Alliance, their mission is to empower people who learn differently across the country. Um, also at experience camps, the mission of experience camps is to give grieving children experiences that change their lives forever. And now, like I said, at Gifted Savings, where we're gifting investment assets to young people. And that's the thing that all three of these organizations have in common, is that they're holding up the megaphone for young people to share their stories, to amplify their voices. And in doing so, they're not just helping those kids, but they're able to help the kids that they haven't reached yet. Because those kids who hear their stories are able to learn from a near peer role model. Um, before we get started, I just wanna share a little bit about myself so that you can get to know me and hopefully I'll get to know you as well. Um, so I started out as an actor uh, doing plays by Shakespeare and Moliere and Shaw um, and a little bit of musical theater as well. And then after that, I moved to New York and very quickly started um, covering the roles of Timon, Pumba, Zazu, and Ed in Disney's The Lion King, first on tour, then in Vegas, then on Broadway, and in London. And it was my experience in the arts that led me to work in arts nonprofits at Eye to Eye, now in the Alliance. And that is what led me to realize that I wanted to take on roles as a leader of nonprofit some of us call them for benefit organizations. It's not just what it's not, it's what it is. Um, and that's why I'm thrilled to be here with you today. So again, thanks for welcoming me. So where are we going to go together? This is a little snapshot of the journey that we'll hope to accomplish in the next slightly under 50 minutes. Um, so first, we're going to touch on what is the power of storytelling. This is something that we've already dug into repeatedly today, but we're going to take that even further. Then we'll ask, why do we tell stories, right? And then third, we'll start thinking about what's your story. Now, we all have a story to tell. Some of you might know instinctively what your story is. Others might say, you know what, I'm not really sure how to craft my experiences into a story. But we'll ask that question and we'll go there. Um, then once you have some ideas of what your story is, we'll talk about what might the key idea of that story be. And then you might not be able to say, see behind these chairs here, but, um, 
we'll offer some tips and tools on how to tell your story. Sound good? Yeah, any questions? No? Okay, cool. Oh, it's all right. So first, a story. Um, this is me in fifth grade, 10 year old Josh. Now, hard as it might be to believe based on this super cool photo of the kid with the bowl cut and the purple belt, I was not the coolest fifth grader, right? When other fifth grade kids were playing baseball, clearly I was doing karate. When they were playing football, I was doing musical theater. So I was a little bit different, right? But that's okay. Looking back on it, that's okay. And the other thing that differentiated me from my classmates was that I missed a lot of school in observance of Jewish holidays. So some years I missed like 10 days of school in a school year. Um, but I was a very conscientious student and I was a perfectionist. And so I would ask my teachers for the assignments that I was going to miss in advance so that I didn't fall behind, right? I couldn't fall behind. And then one day in fifth grade, it was a day not unlike today. I think it was probably a Thursday. It was sunny, right? And I go to school and I walk into my fifth grade classroom and my teacher, his name was Mr. Cornell. Mr. Cornell was like this teacher that all of the fifth grade boys wanted to be like when they grew up. He had this like Tom Selleck mustache, which in 1990 was like super cool. Um, and he was just an all around good guy, right? So I walk into the classroom and I go to my seat in the back row, right by the windows. That's the seat that I was assigned to sit in every day. And I settle in. And I know that like, we're going to go over the assignments that Mr. Cornell told me to do. And it's going to be okay. Because I did them. I feel good about them. I know I have the right answers. It's going to be an okay day. And so Mr. Cornell says, take out lesson number four. Bang. It's already there. And he's asking people for the right answers. And my hand is shooting up for every question because I know I got the right answers. And I want to show Mr. Cornell that I got the right answers. And I want to show everybody else that I got the right answers too. Right? I am crushing it on lesson number four. Then he says, all right, take out lesson number five. Cool. Same thing, right? I know I've done it. I know I'm right. So I'm going to raise my hand for every single thing. Yes, I was that kid. And I'm going to crush it. I'm getting all the answers right. Cool. It's about 1130. We only have about 10 minutes to go before lunch. And I'm done. I'm going to like coast through the rest of the period. And Mr. Cornell says, okay. Take out lesson number six. That, that what, there was no lesson number six, right? Mr. Cornell did not tell me to do lesson number six. I don't know what he's talking about. But as I look around the room, all the other kids are taking out another piece of paper and putting it on their desk. So what do I do? Right? I'm, I'm at a loss. So I just kind of like sink down into my chair. And I figure that if I look inconspicuous enough that Mr. Cornell won't call on me. Keep in mind the prior two pieces of paper, I was going like this the whole time, right? It's a little bit delusional. But I figure if I just sit there and lay low, it'll all be okay. And sure enough, Mr. Cornell calls on Mike and Emily and Phil and Stephanie and Amy and then Josh. Mr. Cornell, I'm really sorry but I didn't do the assignment. And therefore, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm really sorry. I'll have it for you tomorrow and I'll get caught up. That's what I wish I said. What I actually said was, Mr. Cornell, you didn't tell me to do assignment number six, right? And he says, Josh, don't worry about it, Will. And I said, but you didn't tell me to do it. And I'm like getting even more frustrated. He says, Josh, it's, and then I hear it. Ooh, right? And I can feel all of these faces turning and looking at me and I'm starting to sweat. And then it started. Josh didn't do his homework. Josh, right in that sing-songy way that elementary school kids do. Josh didn't do his homework. It gets louder and louder and louder. And I'm just sitting there petrified. I want to crawl under the desk. 
and hide. And thankfully, the bell rings. So I run out of the classroom. I hang a right. I go down the hallway. I throw open the door to the boys' bathroom. And I go inside and I hide inside a stall. And I'm determined that I'm going to like stay there forever or until the end of the day, whichever comes first. And that's how I'm going to cope. And a few seconds later, I hear the door swing open. And somebody comes in and says, Josh, Josh, you in here? And I say nothing. All right, well, come find me whenever you're ready. So I take a beat. I realize that I can't sit in the bathroom stall the entire day. So I shuffle out. The door creaks open. I walk out of the bathroom all the way back down the hall. And I hang a left into Mr. Cornell's room. And he says, come here. And he sits down in his chair at his desk, which puts him directly looking me in the eye. Right. I was not a big fifth grader. And he says to me, are you OK? And I nodded somewhat unconvincingly. And he says, look, I'm going to tell you a secret. It's called Cornell's three C's. This is a very important. When the going gets tough or when the temperature turns up, you got to stay calm, cool, and collected. And until about like three years ago, I was still convinced that Mr. Cornell invented calm, cool, and collected, right? But it hit me in that moment. He said, you can't let them get to you. You got to stay calm, cool, and collected. And it was the first point in my life when anybody had looked at me other than my parents as a person, not just as a kid, not just as a student, but as a person and who really saw me for who I was and demonstrated in that moment that they cared about me and where I was headed by gently putting me in my place from being that kid and saying, you know what? I'm going to give you a tip that might pay dividends along the way. And thankfully he did, because I really don't think that I would be here had it not been for that moment. I would have kept being that annoying perfectionist, like, let me show everybody else what I know. And thankfully it changed my path. Looking back on it also, I realize that all it takes is one person to truly like to take the time and to really listen and to make the effort to show somebody that you care about them. And that one person can truly bring transformative change into the lives of young people. And honestly, I think it's because of Mr. Cornell that I do the work that I do. So thanks for listening to my story. Um, thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, does anybody know what this is? If you know, feel free to shout it out. Yes, cave drawing, cave paintings. These are the caves at Lusco in France. And this is the Hall of the Bulls, right? This is one of the very first instances of visual storing, storytelling that we know about. It goes back something like 20,000 years. And though it's just a painting of some bulls, you can see that they're in motion. And they're interacting with each other. And clearly, whoever painted this 20,000 years ago had a story to tell. We've been doing this for as long as we know. And though the times may change, the stories might not. Or the way that we tell them might just change ever so slightly. So the power of storytelling in a nutshell. Why are stories so powerful? Well, first, and this is something that we've heard about repeatedly in just a couple of hours that we've been here, right? They make us feel something, right? They make us smile. It's the reason we sit around campfires. It's the reason why we go to, to see films or you mentioned the theater, Ryan, right? We do those things because stories make us feel something. Stories are powerful because the hero demonstrates transformation. We get to know them. They encounter some kind of challenge or hardship or trauma. We cheer for them 
And most often they come out on the other side of that emerged, whether triumphant or not, they've changed, right? And as a result of that, we emerge transformed too. It doesn't, it, it can't not make us feel something or see the world in a different way that we've been transformed by somebody else's story. Now, because stories are memorable, they're shareable, right? To your point, Tracy, I think you said, not never forget, but always remember. If we keep sharing stories, this was your advice, Luke. If we keep just sharing the stories, right? They're memorable, we'll be able to share them. And stories make us stronger through those moments of connection, both as individuals and through the causes or organizations that we represent. Oh, okay, great, cool. Thanks for the sound effects. So why do we tell stories? If you haven't had a chance to like voice your ideas yet today, I welcome you to do so now. Why do we tell stories? No wrong answers. We got to be connected. Yes. Connection, connection, connection. Yes. Thank you very much. What's your name? Joseph. Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Legacy. legacy, right? Always remember, carry on legacies. Yes. Thanks, Sarah. Anybody else? Entertainment. Entertainment. Yes. Yes. We don't want to forget. We don't want people to forget. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Healing. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. So, here are some of the reasons that we tell stories. Somebody said to entertain, right? Cultural preservation, that idea that stories are passed from one person to another and from generation to generation to generation. Never forget, always remember the ideas, the morals, the values, the lessons that stories represent. Um, to connect, yes, this is a big one. Joseph, thank you for shouting that out, to connect. Also to find empathy. Sometimes we just need to be heard. And we need somebody else to put them put to put them in our shoes so they understand what we're going through. To inspire, right? This is what we were doing at the ND Alliance by sending out college students who learn differently to share their stories of growing up feeling like they were stupid simply because they learned differently than their peers, and then sharing how they were achieving and doing amazing things. They were inspiring other kids and saying, you're going to be okay. And here are some lessons that you can take from my story and to teach too. But ultimately, the reason we share stories is because we are human. It's what we do. And some would even say that it's a responsibility to share stories, right? It's our responsibility. One of the greatest storytellers in our history, Maya Angelou, said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. Just think about that for a minute. So what's your story? Think about it. I see some quizzical looks around the room. That's okay. Everybody's got a story to tell. Again, some of you might know it like the back of your hand. Others might be like, I have no idea. It's all right. We'll start digging into it. You might be thinking, where do I start? How do I even start to like wrap my brain around what my story might be? Well, here's one way to do it. It's not the way, but it's a helpful tool to start thinking about how to shape your story. What's this? It's a timeline. Yes. Now, this is a somewhat humorous timeline. I'm going to say like it's meant to be humorous. We'll see if it succeeds or not. But this timeline is called How Hollywood Predicted Alien-Human Hybridization, right? And it's just a helpful illustration to remind us of what a timeline is, right? We used to see them in our history books. Now I tend to see them 
in airports, like on their construction progress or whatnot, but it's a timeline. So you've got your axis here. This one is from 1947 and 1995. And all these different boxes are all of the like major media releases of things related to like alien abductions, right? You can see the big events on this timeline in boxes. That's the purpose of this image. Here's another way. Here's another way to think about timelines. Um, I'm praying that this video is going to load. Uh, today's Thursday. This is going to be a bit of a throwback Thursday. Um, and regardless of what any of us thinks about social media, because this is from social media, I'm going to ask you to just go with this because it's, again, a helpful way to illustrate how we think about our story. I see a hand moving. Oh, this is magic. Okay, cool. Thank you to whoever's doing that. Okay, so again, that's throwing it a little back because that's when they first introduced timeline as like the format for the Facebook platform. So did any moments in Andy Sparks's journey stand out as like partic particularly interesting to you? Having kids. Yeah, having kids for sure. Concert? Concert? Yeah. What was interesting about that, Joseph? Oh, I think the fact that all the women were wearing the same blouse shirt, um, and it looked like it was like 1967. Yeah. yeah. But like clearly it was this moment when this guy like came into his own yeah. and was like tearing it up for the ladies. But he just wanted to sell the special. Right. Uh, but clearly a moment that he like found his confidence or like the next version of who he was going to become. Um, okay. So this is, this is a worksheet that is helpful to think about as you construct your own timeline. And as you do this in your story, you are the main character. You are the protagonist the same way that Andy Sparks was in that old Facebook video. So when you think about your own timeline, you can think about like the duration of the trajectory that you want to share. Is it your entire life? Is it the last year? Has the last year been particularly eventful? Or the last five years, the last decade, you name it. And when you think about this, and I have copies of this sheet that I'll give to everybody at the end of this. Um, online, I'll put it back up on the screen so that you can check it out as well. And as you think about this, you're just going to start writing down, like you write the, the year at the start all the way on the left. You're going to write the end time for the duration of what your trajectory is on the right. And you're going to fill in all the events that you can think of. The little inconsequential events. Oh, can we go back one slide? Sorry. Is that possible? Yeah, thank you. The little inconsequential events. Get little dots. The big turning points, those events get big dots. Everybody with me so far? Okay, cool. 
And then you're going to take all of those big dots and you're, gotta, you're gonna draw a line to one of these boxes. And then in the box, you're just gonna start writing all of the details that you can remember about that event. So using it as an example, for me, one box would be titled Cornell's Three C's, right? It was a Thursday, it was sunny. I was coming back from a Jewish holiday. I walked into the classroom. I sit in the chair in the back row, Mr. Cornell, mustache, assignment four, assignment five, right? Like just start writing all the details that you can think of in that box. And then over time, what you're going to do is you're going to have all of the material that you need with each of those boxes being a story. Are there any questions so far? Okay. This is a pretty simple one. Thanks. And it helps you to think about what's your story, right? So for me, Cornell's three C's is clearly a story about allies and support. That's what it is. It's a helpful lesson to other folks that like, again, if somebody just takes the time and makes the effort to believe in somebody else, then that person can bring transformative change into the life of a young person. Um, Obviously, through a lot of what we've talked about today, a story can stem from hardship or trauma or challenges and resilience, right? That's a lot of what Sierra was talking about before. How those things shape your identity in your self-perception, right? Some of us have stories about turning points, right? For Andy Sparks, the moment he was tearing it up for the ladies in the concert, if he were here to share that story, that might be a moment when he said, I realized that I was this person instead of the person that I used to be. Um, tools for success, right? Again, Sierra was talking to us before about the importance of therapy and recommending that we all get therapy. I will also endorse that recommendation. Um, the importance of community and belonging, stigma and bullying. This one has been a big one for those speakers that I used to coach at eye to eye and sharing their journey growing up as different thinkers. Also a common theme for kids from experience camps who have experienced the death of a parent or sibling or primary caregiver, how they go back to school and face stigma or bullying, which is unthinkable, but yet it's still a story that they feel that they want to share. There's also stories of joy and triumph, right? That is kind of like the other side of it. Um, and advocacy and empowerment, standing up for yourself and asking for the things that you need. So your story might take none of these. You might have a story for each and every one of them. It's all up to you. And at the start, though it's a bit cliche, think of your story as a block of clay, right? You need all those details. You need the whole thing to start out. Don't censor yourself at the beginning. We can always carve it away later. And then as you work on your story, you can start getting rid of the extraneous details and shaping it and maybe you spin it around with a couple of friends to get some feedback on it, which also then helps you to realize, oh, I left out that detail about such and such. Or, oh, now I realize the key lesson in this thing that I went through and how to share that with other people. And then when you're done, you're gonna have a story that's a work of art, right? Ideally, it'll have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then a key idea. But then the job is to say, well, what's the function of my story? What does it do? Just like that piece of pottery could have become a plate, it also could have become a bowl or a mug. So what's the function of your story? It might take some time to figure that out, but think about it. So when I was at Eye to Eye, now again, now the Neurodiversity Alliance, we had five pillars in the organization, five key lessons that were kind of like the underpinning for everything that we did. And we realized that all of the stories that our students would share with us just kind of like without even forcing it, they took on the shape of any one of these pillars. So for us, it was self-esteem, right? Believing in yourself, 
self-advocacy skills, standing up for the help or the services that you need. Metacognition, which is basically understanding how your brain works and understanding how you learn. Accommodations, things like extended time on tests, voice to text, text to speech, assistive technology, and allies. So if you're looking for ways to share stories on behalf of a cause or an organization, as you're thinking about those stories, you might think, what are the priorities of this organization? And oh, guess what? My story might actually embody that theme, which helps me to be an ambassador for that thing that I believe in. So how do you prepare? That's the next step and something that so many of us struggle with, right? We might know our story, but it's no secret that like public speaking is a thing. Like people are, we know there are a lot of people who are hesitant to speak in front of others. It's okay. I'm going to share some like ideas on how to prepare. So we've covered box one, build your story. Cool. We're going to do that. Then you need to know your story. And it's not just enough to be like, oh, it's my story. I know it. Right? You need to know that you know it. Right? If you're going to do this in a way that's slightly more formal, Luke and Ryan, to your point earlier about just capturing unfiltered raw stories, yes, absolutely, that has a, a different kind of power to it as well. Right? Um, but if you're going to share a story to this idea of having a takeaway with it, it's helpful to practice, 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 and know your story. Also important to know your audience. Right? Is it like a seminar or a gathering like this in a conference room? Or is it just like a meeting of a couple of people? Is it in a, is it in a classroom with kids? Or is it an, uh, uh, an audience of adults? Um, is it in person or by Zoom, right? Right now, this is both. I realize that people on Zoom might be like bugged by the fact that I keep walking back and forth. I, I don't know how well you can see me. But if I were sitting at a desk, I wouldn't be able to do that. So it's helpful to practice telling your story in a lot of different ways. Um, and then you're going to adjust your story, your energy, and your terminology accordingly based on your audience. Um, and again, I think Luke, you said this. Ryan, I think you said this as well. Be authentic, right? You can only be yourself. Don't try to be anybody else. If you've got a great sense of humor, go ahead and be funny. If you don't, don't feel like you have to try to be funny, right? Just be you and let people get to know you. Your story has value and they're going to want to hear it. I'm going to pause just in case anybody has any questions. Okay, then I'll keep on going. Okay, so once you've done all that, here are like how you dig into finer details of how to shape and craft your story. Peak people's interest with an interesting idea. If you can grab them at the top, they're more likely to stay with you throughout the rest of your story. Use eye contact to make it personal. You might notice that I've been trying to do that with each of you in this room, right? Because it helps us actually to have a conversation even if you're not responding, right? Like I, I can see Ryan nodding his head which gives me something that I'm like, okay, cool. Processing. Awesome. Um, harder to do this on Zoom because there is no eye contact on Zoom. But what you can do if you feel comfortable doing it is try to look into the camera, which is normally at the top middle of your laptop. And that makes people on the other side of the Zoom feel like you're looking at them. Zoom, I'm looking at you. Um, don't rush. It's your story. Own it. Uh, stay on track. Stay on track. So one of our speakers at Eye to Eye, great guy named Travis, has attention issues, right? And Travis would be telling his story, which would remind him of this other thing, which then would remind him of this other thing, right? And before you knew it, Travis was like veering way off track. And then he'd say, what story was I trying to tell? And we likened it to not letting the balloon fly away. And I'd say, Travis, grab the string, just pull that balloon back in, right? So try your best to stay on track. It's helpful to have like signposts to guide you throughout your story. Ask questions, right? It's another way to make it a conversation with people. 
instead of just like being up there in front of them, talking, 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 ask people questions. If you use unfamiliar terms, be sure to explain them. And this might happen if you're representing an organization. So when I first got to the ND Alliance, we talked a lot about LD. And if you're in the neurodiversity community, LD means learning difference, or at that time, learning disability. But if you came from the theater, it meant lighting designer, right? So like, if you're going to use a term, especially if it's an abbreviation or an acronym, be sure to just take that moment to explain it in shorthand so that you're not disengaging people. Uh, take advantage of simile and metaphor if it works. Like this is where you can be creative in sharing your journey. Again, if you're able to structure your story with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and a key idea, that is something that will help to make it memorable. That's one of the things that helps to make your story shareable and then ultimately allows other folks to then share it with others. Um, and then leave time to answer questions. If you're sharing a good story, people might want to ask you about a specific moment from within that story. So make sure you leave yourself some time. Speaking of that, how are we doing on time? We're running out of time. Okay. Um, these are some questions that you can ask yourself as you refine your story. I'll just leave it up here for a minute so you can read through these. Again, like the big one in my story where who were my allies, right? How have I been equipped to help other people? And how did I respond to the challenge that was in front of me? Okay. Um, I'm guessing that we don't have time for the worksheet, but I'm going to hand it out so that you can do it on your own if you'd like to. Um, and then take time to share it with other people. But before we wrap up today, I'd like to leave you with a little gift. So one of my... My closest friend, right? My closest friend of 25 years is my buddy, Dave. And unfortunately, last week, Dave's mom, Vicky, died after a long battle with ovarian cancer. And Dave also, Dave is an awesome storyteller, right? He's just really good at telling stories. And I've heard his stories for years. But what I didn't know, and that I found out when Dave was giving the eulogy for his mom last week, was that his mom was also a very talented storyteller. And Dave used to ask his mom, every time she shared a story, Dave would say, Mom, what was the best part of that story? And inevitably, Vicky would always respond, the best part was being together. Um, so remember that above everything else. It's the time that we're spending together here today. It's stories that connect us. And in a time when the world feels really fractured and broken and divided, I still have hope that if we share stories, it helps to repair that even just the slightest bit to help keep bringing us together. Um, thank you so, so much for inviting me to join you for this conversation today. I'm glad to take any questions if you have them. Yes. What's your name again? John. John. Thanks, John. Maybe no surprise. I'm trying to think of strategies to keep the balloon from flying away. Um, but not, not just that. Synthesizing. What, what is letting go of the balloon and what isn't, right? Because... Sometimes you do want to catch a new idea and it, it brings either another perspective or, or value to it. Um, but yeah, at what point does noise happen? So what I would advise, just as if nothing else than an exercise, is to start just putting your ideas down on paper and seeing how they take the shape of like different anecdotes or different time periods, right? So, I mean, 
if I think about, and Sierra, forgive me, I didn't ask you if we could do this in this moment, but if I think about the story that Sierra shared with me, right, there's clearly before 9-11 and growing up in Bergen County as kind of like a story in itself. And then there's that day and the aftermath and what she talked about with going to the grocery store and her mom needing to go to a different grocery store just to avoid kind of like the additional trauma that that could be. And then there's like Park City. And then after that was when she was talking about clinical depression and what that, and that's kind of like the climax of the story. That is the key obstacle. That's the key thing that she's confronting in that moment. And we're cheering for her to get through it, right? So you can see how in this moment, she has these separate components of her story that all lead to an overall arc. And if you can do that for yourself and kind of compartmentalize each of those, those might be one-offs that you can share, or maybe you share all of them. But ultimately, I'd say practice it with other people and say, did, did that story make sense? Did you get what I was trying to share? And like, would you give any advice? Should I leave anything out or should I stop earlier? Yeah. There absolutely is. Yeah, there absolutely is. And like, again, to what Luke and Ryan were saying before of like, sometimes you just set up a camera and get people to come in and talk. Right. And that is when you can see people at their most unvarnished. And that is so valuable. I think this approach is if you're like looking to share your story repeatedly or in a slightly more like structured way so that it can be used as a force for change consistently and reliably, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, Ryan. Great job, Bruce. Thanks. You too. Uh, no, thanks. Um, I think it might be valuable, valuable if you could speak to your timeline example. And when we're covering such a vast you know, area of time and you have different plot points and story elements, how do you decide which area you want to go with? Like, what is what is your tool to say, okay, these are all really cool ideas, but what's my story out of all these cool, cool things that happened to me? It's a good question. And I think, so what we used to do at Eye to Eye is like piece together, okay, what's the objective? Who's the audience that we're sharing this with? And what are the themes that are most relevant? And then what we would say is, all right, let's pick out these three stories. Here's one about, I'm going to use this example just because it's like closest and, and easily uh, easy for me to talk about. Um, for a lot of these kids who are different thinkers, right? Neuro, neurodivergent, different learners, different thinkers. That first story was about quote unquote diagnosis, right? My friend, Matt, Matt, I'm giving you a shout out right now. Matt was a high school student when I first met him. He's now a science teacher and he credits storytelling as being the thing that led him to pursue a career in education. But Matt would tell the story about diagnosis, going to the doctor with his dad, bringing his pet rock named Fred, and then walking into this office and being like, this is so cool and doing all these tests. And then on the drive home, his dad was like, so Matt, you have something called dyslexia, right? And it was like, that was a key turning point. So I think the thing is, what are the biggest, most key turning points that have the most relevance? Um, are those, can those be kind of like isolated? Or do you have enough time to share the broader arc? Um, this is especially important, like we we're talking about social media, where it's now like 10 or 20 seconds, like clearly it's really hard to share the entire trajectory that Sierra shared with us in 10 seconds. So how can you find a way to just like drop that thing about what has been impactful in my life? To your point, I think, Luke, when you said it's a thing that you click on that takes people to the larger story. Did I answer your question? Okay, cool. Any other questions? I know we probably got to wrap up. Um, I'll place the um, timeline worksheets over here so you can grab one if you want to. Um, and feel free to follow up. Shoot. Oh, yeah. Zoom question. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Um, my question is, how do we find balance between sharing our stories openly while also having boundaries? 
it's that something I personally, it is something I personally struggle with finding a middle ground. And that comes from Adriana. Um, thanks, Adriana. So the first thing that I would say is like, be safe, be good to yourself, right? So don't, don't feel that you need to share anything that you don't want to share. Um, that's key. Your own like well being is first and foremost. Um, full stop. Uh, and I think if it's boundaries as it relates to what people are able to absorb, it again depends on the audience in the forum, right? So if it's like, if it's a storytelling thing on a Saturday night in the village, right, you might have greater latitude in sharing your story than if you're presenting at a conference in the Salesforce Tower at 11 a.m. on a Thursday. I'm, this is, I'm just riffing a little bit here. But think about your audience. Um, and then ultimately, if it's boundaries as it relates to like the ability to understand the story, that's just share it with other folks and see if you kind of need to like compact it a little bit. Um, and then the other thing, I mean, I think John was asking about this before too, is how do you share a story without it turning into just rant or negativity or things like that? And I think that if there's a way to say at the end of it, and this is how I've become transformed, or this is what the other side of it is, it that also helps to kind of put a boundary or let's call it not a boundary, a bookend on the story. Um, I hope that's helpful. But if you want to follow up with me, um, feel free.